This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 576 for October 21 of 2021, designing the Lyric Cadillac's first ever EV. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for Autoline in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Autoline After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Magna. Gary, look, hello, we're both hello, on the show together. This is awesome. Hello, stranger. I know. Jeez. I do feel like a stranger on my own show here. Yeah, you missed, missed two in a row. And, I know. Uh, I know. So, so I had I, duty so, called. I had to work. So so I, I, I've, I've got to give a uh, shout out to Joe White, Keith Naughton, Rain No, Mark Williams. They they were all here for those two weeks. They, they did a great job for us. And uh, um, I was glad they uh, took the time to do it. Yeah, uh, good shows for sure. So, so one of the things I'm sure you've been boning up on while you've been off is is what I might ask you happened at some point in history, and so we're gonna we're gonna have one that's very near in history. Uh oh. Okay, it will be October twenty first, twenty eleven. It's a movie that went into limited theatrical release on this day in twenty eleven. And I am fairly confident that you saw it, oh. perhaps the very day it opened. Oh. Uh, and it has to do with the theme of the show. Uh, I'm dying here, Gary. Uh, the theme of the show is about Cadillac Lyric. I don't remember seeing a movie about the Cadillac Lyric. Well, there wasn't a movie about the Cadillac <laughs> Lyric. Come on, we've got we've got to stretch a little bit here. All right. Okay, you got it. You have to help me out here. It was the Chris Payne documentary, Revenge of the Electric Car. Oh, yeah, I did see that movie. And you probably saw it the day it opened because uh-huh. we were all in a theater in uh, Royal Oak. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. Yep, now that you mention it, I do remember. And Bob Lutz was there and... Uh, yeah. So that was, well, I failed again. 10 years ago today. Yeah. Who'd have thought? Hey, who'd have thought? Hey, let's bring in Henry Payne, who's joining us today. Car critic with the Detroit News. Hey, guys. Hey, Henry, how are you? See it. I was, uh, I was going to guess Cars 2. I'm yeah. A, oh, I'm a cartoon a guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was released in 2011. <laughs> <laughs> well, Henry, you, you had a better guess than I did because I didn't have any guess at all. <laughs> I think there were some Cadillacs in that uh, movie, or certainly tail fin. They kind of had the landscape design like Cadillac tail fins. Those are good right. movies. Yeah, what's that? Cadillac Ranch out in Texas. They had, you know, homage to that in the Cars movie. Yeah. Yeah, good movies. All right, let's get on to real cars. Let's get on to real cars, and let's bring in our two guests today. Brian Smith, who is the director of Cadillac Exterior Design, and Tristan Murphy, the manager of Cadillac Interior Design. And great to have the both of you here. Thanks, John. Hey, nice to be here. Hey, so let's kick the- it off. we got to get this conversation going. But And, and so, Brian, I'll just start with you because i got to start with somebody. Okay. But my understanding is the lyric, all new car. I mean – no carryover components, whatever. Have you ever in your career had a total clean sheet approach to a design? Or do you even know anybody that's had that opportunity? Uh, actually, no. Uh, you know, this is a, a real first, uh, you know, a first EV for Cadillac. And as you mentioned, the the Ultium platform really gave us a clean sheet from the bottom up. Uh, allowed us a lot of creative freedom as a design team, thanks to uh, not being constrained by, you know, large powertrains and, and, and bits and pieces where you expect them. And I think it also really freed up the, just the creative ideas to flow a little more freely because it is so such a new thing for us. Um, it's just a new paradigm shift and, and something that everybody could rally around and get excited about. 
So Tristan, let me ask you from, from your point of view, I mean, so certainly an interior of a vehicle mm -hmm. is something where you have to fill a certain volume with things that are familiar to people like pedals and a steering wheel and, and, and so on. How did you, how did you approach it for this all new I, I endeavor? Think Kind of, kind of going on like what Brian talked about. You know, we really looked at this as an opportunity to really not just think of this as you know the first EV Cadillac, but really kind of let's really rethink what that experience is like on the inside of the car. When you really get inside a Cadillac, what is that experience going to be? How is it going to separate us from the rest of the pack? Right. I mean, we wanted to make sure that we were going to create an environment that really put an emphasis on some of those core values that we thought has been with Cadillac since the beginning, which has always been about this dramatic presence, this sense of beauty, you know, artful, you know, details. And we really focus in on this and trying to create this, not only just putting the technology in the car, but really making sure it really felt like it had been beautifully integrated and really felt like it had been touched by artists and that that was going to be the thing that would make it feel, you know, again, just, special and different compared to what else you see in the marketplace here today. So I, Henry. I think, well, I, you know, the, uh, you guys have, have been uh, Cadillac designers for a while, right? Yeah, for sure. So, so uh, what, what intrigues me about, I was, I was just in the uh, Cadillac CT uh, four and five black wings, which are sensational cars, uh, uh, I mean, two of the elite performance cars in the world, but um, it, it, struck, it, it struck me as I was driving those cars, and I've been inside the Lyric, that uh, that Cadillac sort of took a detour uh, for the last 20 years and decided to make alphanumeric uh, athletic cars to go after BMW and Mercedes at the Nurburgring and, and whatnot. Now you guys are returning sort of to uh, Cadillac's roots. Uh, we're back to uh, proper names, Lyric, Celestique. Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, that 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 pivot to uh, ath athletic um, uh, German beaters is uh, that that detour is over. And now we're kind of going back to Cadillac's early 20th century, very high tech, uh, very luxurious roots. Would I be mistaken? Well, I think there's uh, there's an aspect of that that will that will never go away. I mean, really, Cadillac is about performance, technology, and craftsmanship. And uh, you can take performance in a number of different ways. Uh, with black wing cars, it's you know how fast you go around the track, and with an EV, it's it's range and uh, comfort and quiet and smooth torque. So um, I think there's a lot of different ways to spin that. I think Cadillac is about uh, technology always has been it's something that you know we were the first with electric starters electric headlights uh enclosed cabins automatic climate control you know the list goes on and on and um i think it's just it's very fitting that we're we're switching over to evs and going after the technology you know from the ground up and um i think everybody's going all in and we've got uh, maximum support from everybody you know, from Mary Barra on down through the organization, um, design has the support and we have what we need to, to win. Yeah, but I, I, was I was talking to Brandon Vivian, who's the chief engineer on the Black Wings. I know you guys uh, work with him quite a bit. And, uh, and uh, you know, and I was talking about, you know, how do you go from, how do you go from this really emotional, visceral V8 performance that you have in the Black Wings to absolutely quiet, uh, lyric and celestiques and he and he he made the obvious point uh, that there's a lot of torque there's a lot of power that can be had from electric motors but it just it seems to me this is a very big uh, culture uh, shift uh, within the uh, within the company where you're where you're not thinking Nurburgring so much uh, and and beating uh, BMW M3 times this is more about uh, what what made Cadillac great in the mid 20th centuries, uh, El Dorados, uh, Brogham's, uh, these these uh, these incredibly beautiful style statements that uh, uh, that that would go down Woodward Avenue and and really turn heads. I, I think I think it's it's not necessarily a, or I guess the way that I've thought about it as we've transitioned, it's more you know we we spent like you said over 20 years 
kind of really chasing this performance right and really learning what it really took to compete at that level from a vehicle dynamics standpoint right and that's not going away i think whether it's a lyric or a celestique or whatever as we continue to go down into future cadillacs here those are learnings about what makes a good daily driver car versus on the track and all those things are kind of paired together so i think in a lot of ways even though a lyric yeah is not a nerve or green style car the the things that we have learned and gone through to develop the cars like the black wings are inherently making their way into even the normal driving experience and dynamics of a lyric to make it a better more sporty more engaged driving car so yes and your point that it's like we're 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 not doing the full-on nurburgring style car i still think like to brian's point it's become so ingrained in our dna for cadillac now of, yeah performance is always going to be something that we're going to be talking about and we don't want to just pivot away from these 20 plus years of experiences that we've and knowledge that we've kind of learned from the ground up and uh we actually just want to continue to build on that in a new way with this new with this new technology Dan, right, i would what? add I, I was just going to add to that the v series is still going to be there so uh yeah. we're not walking away from v uh there will be a performance aspect to everything we do mm -hmm. Brian, let's go back to the direction that you guys want to take Cadillac design in. And then Tristan, I'd like to weigh in on the interior, but electric cars give you far more design freedom than ICE cars do. Uh, at the same time, you guys really need to take advantage of this opportunity, what, w once in a century kind of opportunity to start from scratch, reset, mm -hmm. and decide here's where we're going to be going for the next decade or two. So Brian, talk about that, but from a design standpoint, You've got these great proportions on the Lyric. You've got this long, flat hood. You've got great dash to axle. You've got very compact proportions, especially in the rear end. So take it from there, will you? And, and tell us, what are you guys doing from a theme standpoint, a form language standpoint, in taking Cadillac forward in a new era of electric drive? Well, that's a pretty good setup there, uh, John. But yeah, the, the exterior really... We got the proportions we always wanted. Um, as you mentioned, a long, low hood, you know, the, the wheels pushed right to the corners, a wide stance and, and very large wheel and tire package of 22s uh, here on the Lyric uh, shown in the image. Um, but then really, uh, as you mentioned, some of the opportunities really come up on the front end. Uh, we don't have to take in airflow. Uh, we, we take in a little bit of airflow mainly for HVAC but uh, we don't need it to cool a big ice engine up there. And uh, it, it posed a, a new opportunity to really explore a new face for Cadillac. And the black crystal shield that takes the place of a grill adds a really bold graphic to the front end and ties the vertical lamps together uh, in, in a way that a lot of the uh, Cadillacs from even the 50s and 60s had these kind of very wide full width grills that, that linked the lamps. Um, but here we're doing it in a very new way with a uh, polycarbonate shield that's painted black on the back and then a laser actually ablates those stripes away. And then another paint is, uh, is laid in there and then we light it from the back. And it's all radar transparent so that we can enable our, uh, our, our great super cruise system to uh, have better radar placement on the front end. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think you see things in the lighting where we're really exploring vertical lamps in a new way, particularly on the rear where you see the the stacked uh, upper and lower tail lamps, that upper lamp, the way it spins into the uh, C pillar is just really unique and, and fresh. And I think you'll see it from a mile away. You'll know what, you'll know what car you're looking at in, in the dark. Um, it's just a really bold statement. You know, when we're taking these 736 exterior LEDs and, um, and we're taking lighting to a whole new level. Uh, I want to ask too, uh, uh, Brian, I mean, the, uh, yeah, the face of a car is, is um, you know, it it, 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 it it grabs you right away. It also, uh, uh, there's an anthropomorphic pre presence there that we've all gotten used to uh, with, a, with a couple uh, headlights as eyes and a grill as a mouth. And as you say, going electric uh, opens up all kinds of possibilities with, uh, with the face of a car. Uh, how, do, how do you... How do you bridge that? The sort of a, a customer, I think, is looking for a face, but uh, you guys are obviously exploring beyond that as, as more of a neon sign even. 
Yeah, well, you know, uh, exactly. I mean, the, the, the simple way out would have just been to put some body color fascia across there and and have a very kind of uh, faceless appearance. You know, we're, we're all accustomed to having the grill as the nose and the lamps as the eyes. And, um, you know, we took it as an opportunity to, to do something new, but still have the detail. I think there's an expectation of detail in a luxury vehicle that you get in a grill, right? You get layers of um, uh, black plastic and chrome and, and body color in a, in a grill situation on a, on a typical ice engine luxury vehicle. And you can't take all of that off the front end. I think the, the end result would be something a little uh, uninspiring or, 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 uh, or cheap, you know, cheap looking. So uh, we really took that opportunity and, and the lighting just takes it to another level and gives us that opportunity to choreograph the walk-up sequence that you showed there in the segment a minute ago. Um, yeah, we're, we're just really proud. And I think it's, it's, it's given us something to springboard on for future Cadillacs in a, in a really fresh new way. All right. So I get, I get two questions here. Okay. So I got one for each of you. Okay. All right. All right. So I'll start, I'll, I'll start with Tristan. So, so, so Tristan, um, you know, when, when the Escalade came out, there was a big deal made out of the massive screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the Lyric, you guys have a huge screen as well, but it seems to me that what you're doing on the interior of that vehicle is, is paying more attention to the, the details, the secondary reads, that, that yeah. people will sit in the car and look around them and say, wow, that's really cool. What a nice touch there. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Brian, I got one for you after that. Yeah. So, so again, yeah, you know, the, we knew the screen was going to be, um, that's kind of the big first read. You know, we always call it these levels of read when you get into a car, the first read kind of like, what is that big picture kind of that you're, you're experiencing. And obviously the screen kind of sets up the main themes the the big idea of what the interior is, but we really wanted to focus on a design that was really clean and elegant. And when you do that, you have to make sure that the details really stand out. And that means that when you're not relying on extra, all these fussy features or creases in the surface or whatever's here, you have to really make sure you get those secondary or tertiary reads to, to be something that feel special. And again, that feeling of the artist, because those are the things that are basically left over when you're doing clean design. And I think that in the past, maybe we haven't done as well about, you know, getting to that level because that's really hard work to do. I mean, it's every designer and every design team would love to spend the amount of time working on these small little areas, but, you know, the same designers that are working that are also still trying to work on this big picture and getting that all put together to actually do the car. So it really just requires commitment and time and it, and really the, the, the push from up high to say, yeah, we're going to support you guys, give you the time needed to make sure you have the time to get in, work those little finest surfaces. Like, you know, we talked about, I think, when customers get in the car, even the insides of the vents, we have these linear grooves that just kind of finish off the barrel surface. I've never worked on a program where I'm designing so much into the vent beyond that first kind of opening there. And here we're, we're really getting into that level of not just cleaning up the insides, but actually adding those little levels of detail, um, the layers of discovery um, that typically, you know, just, and I don't even say I'm not picking on us, on most cars, it just you don't have the time to get to that level of detail. It takes time, energy, and patience to get there. And uh, and that was really the big commitment from the very beginning was let's, let's really focus on clean design, which means we really need to have the time to do these small details and extra little areas to make them really feel like jewelry. Okay, so 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 Brian, since you're a veteran of the show, I know you're gonna be able to take this. So I'm gonna be devil's advocate here. Okay, so when you look at the Lyric, it looks like a very attractive crossover. Did you guys think about doing something that would look entirely different? I mean, that would look like truly the future. I mean, and I'm talking about like Blade Runner 2049. Uh, well, I think we're almost there with the lyric, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, I don't, you know, it, it has to be beautiful. I think to be uh, something that, somebody wants to plop down $60,000 for, and uh, you have to incite emotion. And, you know, I don't sci-fi futures tend to be kind of blocky, Judge Dredd, you know, uh, gl gloom and doom. Um, you know, we, we really want to emphasize beautiful sculpture, uh, great proportions, simple surface, like Tristan mentioned, 
And the simple surface allows you to explore those details in the lighting and the grills and, and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, and, and as far as the crossover thing, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know that there is even such a thing anymore. I, I think there are just cars. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. sedans are sedans, but everything else is an SUV to the customer. If it's, if it's lifted on big tires, it's an SUV. Um, and in our case, we have to be very efficient about being an SUV. So it's got to cut through the air really well. It's got to have great aero and, um, you know, the low roof proportion sleek. So will that really aid that? I think, I think to build on that too, you know, like what you were kind of saying about the futuristic of like the Blade Runner style stuff, you know, part of our job as designers is to, you know, transition people to think about EVs in a different way and to not feel like they're giving up on anything moving to these things. And I think when you look at, a Blade Runner future, to me at least, I don't look at that and go, well, that's a future I want to live in. <laughs> you know, it's usually actually pretty scary. <laughs> and I think when you look at like what we're doing with Lyric and some of these other future Cadillacs that we're going to prove you, there's a sense of optimism. It's very clean. It is, It is again, like to Brian's point, yeah. it's very clean. There's actually now a little bit more softness even to the exterior that I think is just, it's so inviting. And to me, that's that level of, if you're doing a successful design, the customer should want to be feeling engaged and like that again, that, yeah, this makes me feel warm and I'm not so scared about the future of EVs and transitioning from an ICE vehicles doesn't have to be this scary thing. And I think that that's really what, when you're talking about a job of a designer, right. You know, and when you're trying to, you know, we're all trying to do the better thing for our future and the plan and everything else here, we should be creating something that is about being optimistic and getting more people to feel engaged and wanting to go over to this next stage of vehicles and not feel like they're sacrificing anything. So, yeah. And, and, and just to add on that, I mean, we really didn't want the car to look like a science experiment, right? It, it, it's, it's yeah. an EV, but it's a Cadillac and it has to be the, the future beautiful. of the brand and, and it has to be beautiful. And I would just add that, you know, we've, uh, we've done some uh, consumer research, you know, we've gotten really good at it. Um, the Lyric, is, uh, broke all the records um, for uh, scores in our research events with uh, potential customers. Um, and it's and it's hard because we, we test appeal, whether you like it or not, and we test reach, which is, yeah, it looks futuristic. And it's hard to make them both uh, max out. Uh, usually they'll think, oh, it's really futuristic, but I don't like it. Or I really like it, but it looks like it should be on the road now. Uh, we were able to get up in that top right corner where they were both maxed out on the Lyric. So I think that's really telling um, to show that it, it, it's something great to build on for our future. Tristan, is it, uh, speaking of customer research, did, did you guys spend more time uh, in the interior in particular working with people? Because your your palette has grown so much in the last decade with the electronics available to you. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I get into a Mercedes uh, S-Class these days, for example, and there is so there is so much, so many, so much screen, so many, uh, uh, so many highlights everywhere. It's almost distracting. It's hard to, mm -hmm. it's hard to get beyond the internal bling and, and see the road. Uh, Tesla is obviously the other end of that where they've gone totally yeah, uh, uh, spare. Yeah. I mean, was that a hard place for you all to get to because of uh, how much, how many tools you have to work with now? No, I, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of times, yes, we'll do research, but you know, we also got to trust in ourselves. We, we, a lot of times will have these same pain points as drivers ourselves. When you get into, like you said, a Tesla or where every control has been virtualized. It's like, boy, yeah. Would it have killed them to put a volume knob in here? Or, you know, when you want those, those hard controls for those quick inputs. And, and we kind of, again, we, we discussed this a lot in the beginning and we intentionally, we made a very intentional list of what controls we wanted to leave as hard controls and which controls we want to virtualize. Because I think for us, and again, we go back to the idea of beauty and what that means. We really think that there's the true luxury you, when you go completely all soft or virtual controls, you lose that tactility. You lose that sense of touch. Like, you know, again, going back to that, those levels of detail, we spent a ton of time on the knurling detail around like the little vent adjusters and how that would not only look, but how it felt. Because again, striking that balance of those controls between soft and hard, that's really what's going to give you that rich and, you know, enriching experience. I think, you know, we even talked about when you get into, you know, cars from 50, 60, 70 years ago, how unique everyone would approach these physical controls for your climate settings or your radio and and just those physical engagements really are a big part of the personality of that car and that 
we wanted to make sure that we were, if anything, going to play up on some of that and really bring that back into part of the experience um, so that it really felt like, again, this, this kind of balancing between hard and soft controls. And, and really, we think that that's that magical kind of spot, you know, to be in where it's a, a blend of certain, certain controls there. You, you know so. what? Both of you guys have uh, mentioned that you were given the time to do this right and and be able to get into the detail you're talking about. I'd like to explore that a little bit more because, as, as you all know, I'm saying this more for the audience. Until you guys get your design done, the hard points points on the car are not set. Mm -hmm. I mean, so once you're done with the design, then the engineers and the manufacturing people can go flat out. Not that they're sitting around waiting; they're doing stuff. But uh, and yet. Um, you were given the time to do this very detailed work. Everybody else is waiting for you. And yet at the same time, because you're doing this hardware in the loop, software in the loop, driver in the loop kind of stuff, uh, GM took what, almost two years out of the program or something like that? Uh, how did you work that out of everybody, you know, they got the bit in their mouth, they want to go with this car, but they're waiting for you, but you were given the time to do it the way you did it. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's something that, uh, you know, the concept car really um, was a, a great tool during the development of this vehicle. And Tristan will uh, attest to this, but uh, we were in the throes of the early stages of the production program. And we took uh, about half the team aside and did the concept vehicle uh, to help push the boundaries a little bit. And it allowed us to go fast without engineering uh so much on the side to really create a vision for the car uh you know we had the theme established but there were some things that we wanted to push and we used the concept car to do that and we uh once we got that concept vehicle done we pushed some of those new things back into the production vehicle and that was a great tool for us it was a little disruptive um i know a lot of our partners in the company weren't weren't thrilled about it because it drove a little rework at the end because we had already established some things like door handles, like the, the flush door handles we pulled directly from the concept vehicle. Um, the lower roof, we lowered the roof uh, about an inch right at the end um, because we found that the glass roof and uh, all the section work we had done and the headliner and everything that we had the space to do it. And why wouldn't you take that opportunity to make the vehicle look better and have less frontal area? So, uh, there were a lot of little things like that that happened along the way. It was a very disruptive program because usually we don't um, invent door handle systems and things like that in the main program, like while we're doing it. Um, but we did that in this case, and we pulled the nine months uh, ahead on the production schedule. So, and it was all a lot of it done while we were in COVID lockdown, sitting at home on our laptops. Hmm. So <laughs> it was no mean feat, but. Um, it was a, it was a thrill to be a part of it, and uh, you know we're just so excited that uh, the response has been so great. Yeah, yeah, and, and to build on exactly that, the, the show car really was. I, I think what what really helped about it is it clearly set a vision of like when we say, oh, we wanted to push it, like what Brian was saying with the door remote on the exterior of the car. There, um, it wasn't like some vague vision or a sketch on the wall. It was like, no, here it is. And it's this working thing internally before we even release it to the public. You know, our team was looking at it and leadership was looking at it. So it became very clear. It's like, no, that, you know, and that helps to get everybody just like focus and align. And you talk about working more efficiently. Like Brian said, they, not everybody was happy about it, but it, it very clearly, at least from a design side, it lines it all up just right away. Like this is what we're trying to do here. And especially, you know, um, other parts of the company helps sometimes to see it too, when you get other people are excited too. And all of a sudden it's, again, it's not just a sketch on the wall or a, or a clay mock-up on the design. They're actually engaging with it. Uh, that also gets people said like, oh yeah, we, we have to do these. We, we, we gotta do this. And whereas before, you know, sometimes you can only sell an idea so much with a sketch or an animation or whatever it is compared to seeing in person. I remember on the interior, um, on the uh, the wood decor, we're doing the uh, the laser cut uh, pattern with the backlit lighting. That doesn't exist in the industry. And that was one same thing like Brian was saying, originally we had something that was gonna be a little bit more simplified. It definitely did not have any lighting. And when, every, when we did it on the show car, we, we really wanted to push it and everybody loved it so much. I remember Mark Royce came in and was like, we're absolutely doing that. It's like, we're not gonna show this and then have somebody else come out afterwards and steal our idea. And, uh, 
And again, it was just one of those, that's what's great about having, and even though it's extra work for all our teams, because like Brian said, it's the same team that's you know, straddling doing the production car and doing the show car. Um, they can really, they can really benefit you and really benefit the end results. So real good. Well, we've uh, reached the, the end of the first section of the show. I want to thank both of you for coming on. This has been fascinating. I can't wait to drive the vehicle. You know, I've seen it. It's beautiful inside and out. Uh, and I got to believe it's going to drive as well as it looks. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. So yeah. thank you guys Thanks for having us. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, sure. we'll, get you, we'll, we'll get you back again, Brian. So you'll be like racking these things up. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Keep designing them. <laughs> you got it. Okay, uh, thank you guys. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. We're going to take a quick commercial ba- break, and we're going to be coming back to talk about all kinds of things going on in the industry. And we're back. And we are back. So, Good Gary, I know you got a number of topics. I, I got to okay, okay. I'll find something a little different. I'll switch things up a little bit here because I see Henry wearing the Knack Toy shirt. So, for those of you not familiar, it's North American Car Truck and Utility of the Year. There he is. He's got his he's got his shirt on. So, the three of us spent the last several days test driving cars back to back to back to back. The semifinalists for the awards. And included in those vehicles that we had the opportunity to drive are the Hummer EV and the Rivian R1T, okay? And I know people wanna know what we thought about those vehicles, but let's let's save that for dessert. So what I wanna do is just walk through some of these vehicles and I know that you both have driven all of them and I, I wanna get your impressions of them. Now this won't give anything away in terms of your voting for the finalists, but this will give the viewers an opportunity to have a sense of what the new vehicles are like. So I have a list here, so I'll be able to take us right through the list. Rapid fire style. Exactly. So, okay. Audi A3 and S3. You want to start Henry? I I like it, but, uh, but I'd buy a golf uh, GTI or, or uh, golf R first. Yeah, I am totally with Henry on that. I, I didn't get into the S3. I did get in the A3. Really a nice car, but it's about $12,000 more than a GTI. And I think, you know, grins per dollar, the GTI delivers just as well as the Audi does. And the GTI is one of the cars that is in contention, so um, as well as the normal Golf. Well, and and, and Gary, just uh, just to belabor the point, but uh, I, I think that's going back to our, our discussion with Tristan and uh, Brian, this, the, the electronics have come into cars, I think have really narrowed the gap between a luxury and mainstream. So the Audi and the Golf are on the same platform, same front wheel drive platform. They're both sensational handling mechanically, but then you get inside the cars and now the electronics and the Golf are really, really good. I mean, they're, mm-hmm. you know, where luxury was five years ago. So I, I think, uh, it it, uh, it really it, it really makes it hard on the the luxury guys to to prove their ten thousand dollar worth. Okay, so moving right along, the CTS V Blackwing. You mentioned that earlier. What do you think, Henry? Oh, I, I love that car, and that's I think this is what's really going to be hard for the electric vehicles. Uh, you you get into a Hyundai Ionic, you get into a VD a VW ID four, you get into a Tesla Model three. They all have the same personality. They have this wonderful torque off the line, and then they're quiet. And then you get into, I, I've got a Porsche uh, Cayman in my in my driveway right now with a flat six engine. You get into a Cadillac CT5 Blackwing with this glorious supercharged V8. They have so much personality, so much visceral 
uh, emotion. I think that's that's really going to be hard for EVs to uh, to compete against. John, totally agree. You know, uh, I get out of electrics and I get into it a lot of ICE vehicles, and it feels like I'm stepping back into the 19th century, but not with something like the CTI a CT5V Blackwing. Uh, to Henry's point, it's visceral. I mean, it rumbles through the car. You hear it. You feel it. Uh, getting on it, backing off it, downshifting. You just get this, you know, emotional connection with the car that no electric's going to give you. And and I'm not just an electrics. I, I, I know we're going that way, and I'm all for it. But uh, it's only in the performance end of things that I'm going to miss a, a performance engine, whether it's a flat six, a, a turbo inline, V8, whatever. But uh, the rest of it, like I said, feels 19th century when it comes to ice engines. It's only the performance ones that I'm going to miss. All right. So, so Henry, you, you also mentioned the Mercedes S-Class, which is another contender. Yeah, a, a beautiful vehicle, a uh, little out of my uh, uh, price range. Aww. but but. It, but but uh, but uh, and I made this comment to uh, to Tristan. Uh, you get into the thing; <laughs> it's so beautiful inside. It's uh, it's it's an it's an art gallery of light inside that it's um, it can be distracting. There's so much going on with the. I mean, it's changing colors all the time. I know you can turn that off, but there are all these LED lights surrounding the cabin, purples and reds and. And uh, and then you got this huge screen in front of you. It's a it's a fantastic piece, um, but I, I I feel like Mercedes um, uh, almost needs to dial it back a bit. John, you you had some experience with that, and you mentioned uh, that in a show or two ago. Yeah, the the, the car's too complicated. In fact, <laughs> on the Nactoy drive, I was trying to find the trip computer so I could you know track how many miles I was driving. I could not find it. I had to open the glove box and pull the owner's manual out. Still couldn't find it. There was nothing in there about it. And, you know, that's something very, very simple. Maybe there's an easy way to do it, but I don't like cars that force me to study the vehicle and study the owner's manual to get in and go. And it's a shame because, to your point, Henry, it's a beautiful car. It drives like a dream. The the, the craftsmanship that are, are in it, absolutely world class. But my guess is most S-Class owners never use a fraction of this technology. In fact, I'll be willing to bet most S-Class owners don't even want it. Well, it's just like people who own computers and use just a very, very small slice of the capabilities. All right. Genesis G70. Great, great driver's car. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I, it's, it's, it's right there, I think, in handling with the, um, with the BMW 2 Series, the uh, Alpha uh, Julia Cadillac uh, CT4. Uh, really wonderful, uh, 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 small compact. Uh, um, uh, you know, and again, I, I, I get back to these hot hatches like the VW GTIs that are uh, that offer such utility with them. Uh, the utility in a G70 is a little lacking, small back seat, uh, not a whole lot of cargo space. And again, I go, I, I go it, does it justify its $10,000 premium over a Hyundai Elantra N or a uh, or a Golf R, which are so good? Okay, but but Henry, t to that point, I mean, if we go to a CT4 or even a CT5, I mean, the utility of either of those vehicles is yeah, yeah, not yeah. there. All right. Yeah, I'm just saying so, that's yeah, it's a okay. it, it, it's a it's a niche, and there's there's cars that have pretty close to the horsepower with a little more uh, utility. These hatchbacks that uh, I don't know that people shop that way. I, I think I think once you make a commitment to luxury, you go to those brands. But in terms of what's available on the market these days, mainstream. Uh, uh, performance cars are really, really good. Mm -hmm. John, what do you think of the uh, Genesis G70? Very Mercedes-like. I mean, inside the in, vehicle. In a good way? or In, in a, a good way. No, no, no. In a very good way. So it, it's very sophisticated with its screen and the electronics and all the menus you can dial down into, but much simpler to figure out than the S-Class. Now, it's not in the S-Class segment, right? Several segments down, but it's 
it's probably very comparable to, I, I don't know, maybe like a GLC Mercedes. Um, and so, you know, uh, Mercedes doesn't have to worry about Genesis yet, but man, Genesis is starting to produce cars that are even Steven in my book with, with Mercedes. My, my one criticism is from the, the rear three quarter view, the GD 70, very busy. It's the first design out of Genesis, out of the new era Genesis, that I really don't like. But I got to tell you, I, I had to drive one to the airport a, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, as I got on the shuttle bus that takes you from the parking lot to the, uh, that uh, the driver said, wow, what is that? And I said, oh, you know, it's, it's the new Genesis. Uh, and they said, wow, is that pretty? And don't you love it? And I said, no. I don't like it. I, I hate that line that's, uh, you know, curving down at the back and some woman on the bus pops up, but that's the most beautiful part of it. So, you know, take what I say in styling with a grain of salt. I'm not the customer, but I, like I said, I thought too busy and we haven't seen too busy of a design from Genesis yet. Okay. But, but I, no, 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 but no, no. We got we to keep moving, Henry. We got to keep moving. Kind of moving on beyond that one. Okay. Honda Civic. <laughs> Boy, what a, what a dramatic change from the last generation, uh, which, which was, uh, you know, looked like it was designed by a 17-year-old with a crayon. And uh, and now it's uh, much, much more conservative. Uh, the Honda, We've been driving the, um, the uh, Honda Civic Sport, which is the uh, hatch version of the car out in uh, at Nactoy. And at first blush, it's a Honda Accord. I mean, it's it's very conservative, very sleek lines. It's, it's amazing how much... The styling has changed from one generation to another, and it'll be interesting to see how the cons consumers react to that. I remember when um, when Hyundai really wanted to make a splash with the Sonata uh, in the midsize segment, and and did this very daring uh, 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 design, and then the next generation they went very conservative and they went too far. And it'll be interesting to see if uh, if the Civic maintains the customers that. On, on the whole, really found the Civic stood out from the crowd with this last uh, crayon designed uh, Civic. So, so there was just to be fair, there was also a sedan out there. So um, it's yeah. just not a hatch. So, John, what did you think? Yeah, yeah I'm not a fan of Honda styling, even even with the new one. But that new Civic is terrific. It is as quiet as a tomb inside, even at highway speeds, 80 miles an hour. Um, it it just feels far more sophisticated than any Civic has felt uh, before. And as I was driving around Ann Arbor, somebody beeps the horn next to me at the, the stoplight, says, what do you think about the car? I've been reading all about it. And I said, you know, just what I told you guys, very quiet, drives like a dream. He asked me, is that the six speed? I mean, so here's just somebody driving around Ann Arbor, instantly recognized it, knew quite a bit about the car. That probably bodes well for Honda. You know, you know, it struck me, and this goes back to the first car we talked about, the the Audi A3. So I got out of the Civic and into the A3. And while I understand that the Audi brand is an aspirational brand and the Honda brand is more of a bread and butter brand, I'm just like saying to myself, is is it worth it to go beyond what those guys offer? I mean, I was really, really surprised. I think they did a great job on this car. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now let's move on to the sport utilities because I don't want to go to the pickups because that's where you guys are going to go crazy. Um, Ford Bronco. Yeah, I didn't drive it on, on, on this trip. I've driven it before. I, I think Ford's got a hit on its hands. And, uh, you know, we'll have to do another show on this. Webasto has finally figured out how to make the roofs. So you, you should see them cranking up production pretty quickly as long as they can get the chips. What'd you think about the car, Henry? I think they've knocked it out of the park, Gary. I mean, I, uh, I, 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 I understand they basically took a Jeep and and uh, <laughs> and cop and copied the Jeep feature for feature, but I think they've they've made it uh, they've made it their own. They've made the features more modern. I, I had one I drove all over uh, Holly Oaks uh, ORV Park during Detroit Four Fest. Had a number of uh, off road people get into the car. They were blown away. And uh, by how easy it is to operate, um, the transfer case, the, uh, the the drive modes, it's really an easy off-road vehicle to operate while you're while you're in the dirt. I mean, you're just turn, you're just 
you know, punching buttons and, and uh, turning knobs and changing the character of the car while you're in the dirt. Uh, it's, it's really an impressive vehicle. So, so while I agree with all that, here, here's one of my takes on it. And it goes to the roof, John, and it goes to what, Henry, you were talking about, its dirt capability. I think that most people are going to be driving this to work and back mm -hmm. or to the grocery store and back or yeah, they're taking well a trip. They're, they're taking a trip up north. It looks looks like a, a finely crafted machine, but the problem is the interior noise is deafening. I, I'm I'm sorry, those giant wheels. I mean, it's just it's just <laughs> tough, and I think that is going to surprise a lot of people who are saying, you know, I have no intention of off roading, but I want one of those things. I mean, the same way a lot of people buy Jeeps because they want one of those things, and then they discover that that Wrangler really isn't all that. Uh, quiet on the inside. So I, I think that's going to be a surprise to some people. Okay. Another Genesis GV70, same platform as the G70 car. I, I, I like the, uh, back to John's point about the styling. I, I, I'm impressed at how Genesis in the second generation has uh, separated itself style-wise. I thought the uh, initial generation Genesis were, uh, um, were, were copycat designs looked a lot like Audis. I, I think uh, uh, the the uh, it was uh, a German designer they brought in, right? Vonda. Uh, 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 Luke uh, Donkervalka is the head of all. Uh, uh, but he's been promoted now. A guy named Sung Yup Lee is uh, running Genesis Design. Who yeah. used to work for General Motors. But I, I thought, yeah, I thought they did, they've done a really nice job separating the car, uh, and and it stands out on the road. That uh, split headlight design that they can that they maintain that theme around the car uh, really separates it. My my biggest problem with the Genesis is I think they've over engineered the console. I find the uh, I find the uh, the, the info pain, infotainment uh, controller to be very wonky. So it's, it's, I wish, a big, I wish, it's, it's a it's a big dial that that is is crystalline. I mean, it's 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 very unusual. John, what do you think about the car? Yeah, I go, going back to the the, the crystalline, you know, uh, controller. You got to learn it. It's not intuitive. Once you learn it, though, it's very easy, and and you can get to what you want very quickly. Look, Genesis is doing a great job. A beautiful cars, very well engineered. The problem is uh, the general public still doesn't even know that they exist. And when I say general public, I mean general public within the luxury segment. They're still largely invisible. That's their biggest challenge, you know, from a technology, design, engineering, manufacturing standpoint. They're right there with everybody else. No one knows that they're there, though. All right. Um, here's a, a member of the of the family, the Hyundai Tucson. I love, I love that vehicle. Uh, and again, um, I, I, I like it because it's, it's pushing the envelope. Uh, Hyundai is trying to stand out. It's hard to do in the, uh, in the SUV, seg uh, SUV segment, but uh, the Tucson does. It's got uh, that radical sheet metal. And, but then uh, they don't stop there. You go inside, and I think it's got one of the most unique interiors in the industry. Uh, they've, they've, uh, they've, they've, they're, they're using... Uh, in my opinion, uh, digital technology the way it should be used. They're, they're getting rid of the hood on the instrument display, just putting in a, uh, a, uh, a I think it's an LED screen. Uh, the Mustang Mach-E does that. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're taking the tools, these electronic tools, and they're really pushing the design envelope with them too. So I, I'm very impressed with that car. John? So, imp so impressive to see how uh, Hyundai is right with the, the leading luxury brands in getting technology into its mass market cars. And the Santa Fe is a great example of that. Um, you know, things like incorporating artificial intelligence into the adaptive cruise control and things like that. I mean, you know, uh, at a time when only Tesla would allow you to open and unlock and lock your car, pull it out of a park spot or put it back in just using your phone. I mean, it's Hyundai is right there with the latest technology, but it's doing it in mass market cars. Yeah. All right. Um, we're going to have a couple of uh, products here from, from Jeep brand, the Jeep, Jeep Grand Cherokee, which comes in flavors now, normal Grand Cherokee, Grand Cherokee L three row vehicle. What do you guys think? 
I, I, I'm impressed by the Grand Cherokee, the L, and the Wagoneer. I, I think. Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Separate these. No Wagoneer yet. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're not sitting on their laurels. I mean, this this is a brand with enormous, uh, as opposed to, Gen to Genesis, this is a brand with with enormous brand awareness uh, to the degree that people sh cross shop it between mainstream and luxury brands. That rare brand, uh, when I when I have a, a neighbor comes over and says, "You know, what should I what should I look at uh, for my next car? Should I look at a BMW, a Mercedes, or a Jeep?" And uh, <laughs> and I think and I think Jeep is embracing that. I mean, obviously they they know they can charge a premium over their mainstream competitors. And now they're putting the technology inside these uh, these cars, uh, the, the Grand Cherokee and the L, that makes them competitive with luxury peers. John? Yeah, they've really stepped it up. Uh, you know, they've always had a, a pretty good uh, infotainment system, user interface and the like. It's even better right now. Everything reacts super fast. I mean, they spent the money to get the right kind of processor in there to make this thing uh, really happen quickly. Also, they've really stepped up the interior. I mean, the craftsmanship, the diamond stitching in the seats and the, the combination of colors, it really looks expensive. And just to make sure that you know it is expensive, boy, is it pricey. I mean, I, I just got out of a Grand Cherokee that was uh, 70,000 bucks. I mean, it, to me, it's almost like 70 grand is the new 50 grand. Uh, and it wasn't just but a few years ago. That's what a, a decently equipped Grand Cherokee was going for. It was 50, and we thought that was expensive. So I love the vehicle. I'm, I'm getting concerned about how expensive they're getting. Uh, and can they maintain their sales in the face of all the competition that's coming their way? Because now, you know, the, the rest of the industry finally woke up as to how much money you can make in the Jeep segment. And they're all gunning for that brand now. All right. Got to move on here quickly. You guys are just just going on and okay. on about okay. this technology. Jesus, yeah. no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. I I think the Grand Wagoneer is breathtaking. It's just the presence of that thing is just just extraordinary. But what do you guys think? Well, it has to be. I mean, it's it's going up against the Navigator and the Escalade for goodness' sake, which uh, define bling in the industry. So I, I think. Uh, Grand Wagoneer is doing what it's got to do. Uh, I, I'll second John's point, though. I mean, uh, the, the vehicle list we're talking about here, what's the what's the cheapest vehicle we've talked about? A $30,000 uh, Hyundai Tucson? I mean, how, how many customers are, are there out there that can buy uh, $90,000 Grand Wagoneers? Uh, Try 104000 That's what the one I drove cost. Yeah. Well, Henry, there's you, but okay. John, what do you think? <laughs> so I'm with you, breathtaking. In fact, I told the, the, the people in Auburn Hills and Jeep, I didn't know they were capable of making a vehicle that good. It's absolutely world-class. The interior is stunning. The way it drives is great. But I will say this, I still don't like the exterior styling. I, some people love it. And like I said, that's why they make vanilla and chocolate ice cream, different tastes for different folks. I haven't warmed up to it. The one thing that I did notice is they really blinged up the rear end. You know, everybody puts on these massive grills and everything like that. And the headlamps are the jewelry. That's got to be the most blinged up rear end on a vehicle, at least in that segment. Right. Um, Nissan Pathfinder. A uh, very, very good SUV, and uh, and 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 I got to, to get to the value equation. I like well, the the car that I've really liked in that segment, and this has been a, for a couple of years now. Is the Kia Telluride? I thought they are. Um, am I right, Kia? I get them mixed up. Hyundai Palisade, yeah, yeah. Kia yeah, Telluride. Yeah. I, I thought the the Kia Telluride came into that segment and reminded people that this is a family segment. You need to offer value. Uh, down at the uh, the high 30s, the low 40s in this three row segment. And I think Nissan comes in at that end of the segment as well. You can get all kinds of great stuff in that segment. Uh, Ford Explorer, Explorer ST comes comes to mind. But I think that's uh, that that car is is well north of fifty thousand dollars. I, I like that Nissan is sticking to its bed and bed and 
uh, bread and butter, which is a value equation. At the same time, updating the technology, bring pe bringing people in that segment all the electronics uh, that they deserve um, in, in this uh, in this uh, revolutionary uh, technical time. John? Totally, with, totally with Henry on that. The, the one thing that I'll point out is. They used to have a CVT in there. They got rid of the CVT. They put in an, uh, a conventional transmission, and that really allowed them to boost their towing capability. And these days, there's so much focus on towing. It's amazing. And uh, the American consumer is waking up to that, too. There's a lot more people that want to tow something these days. So that was a big deal for Nissan to walk away from the CVT, which they had made such a big deal about, and go with a conventional transmission. All right, we mentioned Kia, Kia Carnival, a minivan. Best, best second row seat in the business. This, this, uh, the second row seat and, and minivans, you know, uh, across the board, Chrysler, they've done all kinds of wonderful stuff in the second row. Uh, the Carnival has Barca loungers. It's an option. They have Barca loungers in the second row. And I, and I would urge anybody in the minivan segment uh, who has uh, kids or adults who spend any time in the second row, get the, get the Barca lounger option on the Kia Carnival. They are fantastic. They recline. Uh, they, they have a, a, a ton of um, uh, uh, leg uh, support underneath you. Uh, you can just sit back there and, uh, and, and watch a movie on your laptop and uh, think you're in a living room, not in a car. Not only that, um, you know, it's the minivan that was designed for people who want the rest of the world to think they're driving an SUV. Doesn't look like a minivan at all. Mm. The other thing, too, though, is uh, the the front end, the front grill has got slots on it that a lot of people think make it look like a Jeep. In fact, I had several people ask me when I was test driving it, is that a Jeep? And uh, I'm, I'm sure that was not a coincidence that uh, the grill ended up looking that way. So very good vehicle. And getting back to the whole uh, Hyundai Kia story of value for the money, the one I drove, which was very nicely equipped, was $38,000. And in today's market, that's a bargain. Yeah. Below okay, average um, the, the final, final in this category. No, oh, we don't need to go on that again. The, the final in this category, VW ID4, the electric, uh, electric crossover from Volkswagen. I, you know, I like, uh, I like all electrics. I like that, uh, that every brand, just as we were talking at the top of the hour with Cadillac, they're, they're using the opportunity of electric to, to, uh, explore their own brands, to, to explore, uh, new space in cars. And VW is clearly doing that with the ID4. They're trying new things. It's a very simple, uh, different design approach. Um, my my my, my uh, issue with uh, VW is anecdotal. Um, th this is a brand that is that is putting a lot on this car. This this is the, they are advertising the V the ID four as their 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 uh, halo electric car. I just uh, got into one to take a trip to West Virginia. And it, uh, I plugged in my trip route to West Virginia. It took me, it, the trip route planner said it would take me 16 hours to get, uh, for, to travel 400 miles from Detroit to Charleston, West Virginia. Why? Because it made four stops at 240 level two chargers. There are Electrify America chargers between here and Charleston, West Virginia. But, uh, but uh, VW won't bring those into their navigation system until next year via an OTA update. I mean, if you're going to bring a, a revolutionary car into the market like the VW ID4, you got to bring it with, with you got to bring it now with everything loaded and ready to go. And I, I don't feel like the uh, VW ID4 is, um, is ready for prime time yet. Totally agreed. So, you know, on our NACTOY test drive day, I drive uh, a 20 minute loop. Five minutes city, five minutes highway, 10 minutes, two lane, steady state roads. In the ID4 on my 20 minute route, I used 3.7 kilowatt hours of electricity. Then I took the Hyundai Ionic out on the same route and used 2.1 
kilowatt hours. You can't talk about the ionic, so let's let's move on. Oh, we can't talk about that? Okay. Darn it. Well, anyway, uh, to your point, Henry, Volkswagen needs to come with its A game. And uh, its A game happened in terms of what the market wants two or three years ago. All right. So all I'm going to say about it is, is that I like the fact that the ID4 seems to be like a normal car that happens to be an electric car. The interior looks very normal. The operation is very normal. And so for people who are, you know, as, as, as uh, Brian Smith was saying earlier, you know, you want people to get in these things and feel comfortable, not like they're doing something that is, that is unimaginable. It's just, just normal. Okay. So now we're now the big category and Henry, you, you've got 15 minutes here cause you got to leave. So, so we're going to have to go through these in a, in, in a real a, rapid a, fire. Well, <laughs> I, I, I think that, uh, Two of them you'll do rapid fire, and the rest of them you're gonna. All right, Nissan uh, Nissan Frontier. Uh, uh, John and I talked about this at the uh, drive. Where were we, John? In uh, in uh, Utah. In Utah, um, uh, it's 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 the best midsize truck out there, probably because it's the it's the most recent entry. But what I what I what I uh, love about it. It, it 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 does it does very good uh, things. Uh, uh, does a couple of unique things like uh, put bushings uh, between the cab and the and the uh, truck rails in order to make the uh, the ride much more compliant uh, for for a uh, truck. But the, the the other thing is wonderful is that this is the first uh, new all new uh, Nissan pickup since two thousand and seven. Think, think of how the world has changed since 2007. And so I, I thought it was really, it's, it's really neat to get into this uh, Nissan pickup and, and see them update it for uh, the new world. It's really, it's really a good pickup. And again, in classic uh, Nissan fashion, it's a very good value. Yeah. All, all I'm going to say is best of the, the midsize pickups right now, just to save time. And Henry, as Orson Welles said, no pickup before it's time. Um, <laughs> Toyota Tundra. Yeah, this was my first chance in the truck. Um, I hadn't been in it before. Really impressed. Boy, did they do their homework. I drove the, the total blinged out 1794 edition Max 4x4 crew cab. And uh, boy, it, it rides and drives beautifully. Lots of power. Uh, I think they're going to do well. Personally, I, I don't like the styling. I think the, the front end grill is garish. But again, that's why they make vanilla and chocolate. <laughs> and that's and that's so on brand with Toyota. Uh, you know, everything that Toyota and Lexus make these days is in your in your face. It's there to get attention. And uh, this this truck uh, deserves attention. Uh, obviously, an extremely difficult uh, segment uh, going up against the Detroit three. But. What, what I like about uh, the Toyota is they go to, to Toyota's strengths. You know this thing is going to be bulletproof. Uh, it's got the it's got the scarce styling, so it's going to get your attention. And they are the first hybrid in the uh, pickup truck segment. That is a huge strength mm -hmm. uh, for uh, Toyota. They make good hybrids, and uh, so uh, rather than go go uh, continue with the V8, uh, they, they've gone to a V6. Uh, hybrid, which is the top performing engine. I think that's a smart move on their part. Okay. And so, so just to clarify, Ford actually has a hybrid in oh, you're the right. F-150. And, you're right. but the difference between the Ford hybrid is the Ford is being used for um, gasoline burning improvement. And the purpose of the hybrid in the Tundra is power. So yeah. it, it so when you get on the accelerator before the turbos kick in, you've got the the um, hybrid providing the power. Yeah, we had Mike Swears on the show when they did the mid cycle refresh of the last generation. We got to get him back on the show, chief engineer for the the Tundra. I, I spent a lot of time talking to him, and um, I, I you know he lives on a farm. He builds this thing for himself. I mean, it's just just <laughs> simply that. Yeah. Um, okay, now we're getting into the interesting ones that I know you guys are going to be all excited about. The Ford Maverick. Uh, the Ford Maverick may be my car of the year. Uh, uh, you know, we're talking about how 
how high prices have gone uh, in this industry in the last uh, few years. This this is a entry level pickup at twenty thousand dollars. I mean twenty twenty one thousand when you add destination and, and not only that. I mean and this is no um, you know this this is no bare bones standard vehicle. This is a vehicle that comes with a hybrid engine with 40 miles per gallon highway at that price at $21,000. Uh, pretty good styling. The steel wheels, I think, are very fashionable and then just comes with a, a ton of utility. Uh, we'll, we'll see if if uh, the customers are there for a unibody pickup, but something tells me because it's got a Ford badge on it, uh, people are going to look at it. It's getting a lot of attention because of the 42 city is what they came out with officially 37 miles to the gallon combined on my loop that I drove my 20, my famous 20 mile loop. I got, are you ready for this? 52.4 miles to the gallon. I was stunned by that. Um, I, I think they got a hit on their hands. I, I, I think if they play their cards, right. Uh, the Mavericks got a chance of be, becoming something of a cult vehicle. And so for those of you who want to know more about the Maverick, watch last week's show where we have Scott Anderson, who was in part of the design team for that. And we talk all about that utility that Henry's talking about. Okay. Another Hyundai, the Santa Cruz. And in the same segment as, uh, as the Ford. Um, and, and I, and I, and I, and I love it, uh, in part because it's so different than the Maverick. I mean, it's, uh, it's not quite as affordable, uh, which is probably smart on their part because, uh, uh, they're going to look for a, a more premium customer in that segment who's willing to take a bet on a Hyundai pickup truck, but it, it's got some fabulous stuff. It's got a, that, that, that the Maverick does not have. It's got a sub, sub uh, trunk in the rear it's got a uh, an optional tonneau cover that that uh, pull, pulls over uh, like a uh, a sliding tonneau cover pulls over like a curtain really really innovative and uh, the rest of it up front is the Hyundai Tucson which I've already raved about fun to drive the Santa Cruz uh got you know good power and all but I got, I got to tell you, what I was so impressed with driving it is the cabin is so quiet. I mean, it's it it's right there with the Mercedes S-Class, 80 miles an hour. I mean, I'd, I'd have to actually measure the, uh, the decibels. But just to my ear, that that Santa Cruz was as quiet as the Mercedes was. Yeah, it's, it's you know, to, to, to both of your points, I mean, so... I, I don't see somebody who would buy a Maverick considering the Santa Cruz and then vice versa. I mean, with the, with the Maverick being more of a truck, despite the fact that they're both unibody vehicles and, and the Santa Cruz, you know, with the amenities, with the comfort. And, and it, it does have that very nice box back there. And, and I agree, Henry, that that tonneau cover with those, those metal slats is just, it's just wonderful. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's just, just a feat of engineering. All right. So I wish I had a drum roll. The Hummer EV pickup. <laughs> it's uh, boy, what what a what a great toy. I mean, it's uh, you know, it's a hundred and ten thousand uh, dollar thing. This is a, a truly a halo vehicle for uh, GM's electric ambitions. Uh, I had the opportunity to take it uh, on road, off road, uh, out at Milford Proving Grounds. It, it it's a riot to drive. It weighs 9,000 pounds. I mean, <laughs> you know, if, if I pulled into my garage, assuming it even fits in my garage, it may fall through the uh, floor. <laughs> but uh, but in terms of uh, uh, realizing the full capability of a uh, of, of a electric vehicle, uh, 3.0, 0 to 60, which is absurd in a 9,000 pound thing, uh, and the, and the way they use the uh, electric motors to do the crab walking, it's 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 really fun for those who can afford it. Yeah, but just to, before you say something, John, I just wanted Henry, you're talking about the the fast acceleration, and they have the WTF mode, which is of course watts to freedom. So. <laughs> all right, uh, John. Well, we all know we all want we all know what WTF means. It means watts wa to freedom. Watts to freedom. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, Technological tour de force, the Hummer EV. 
engineering tour de force. It is so impressive what they've done with that vehicle. And because it's got four-wheel steering, it drives small. Even though it's this big, hulking vehicle, it's probably got about the same turning radius as the Civic that we were talking about earlier. And the crab mode is totally weird. I mean, it feels like you got four whiskeys in you as you go. It, it, you just feel so discombobulated and disconnected. Uh, it's it's going to be the ultimate bling mobile. I mean, I, I see the rap community, the sports community, the entertainment community. They're going to be all over this, and they'll happily pay the hundred and twelve or hundred and thirteen thousand dollars to get this thing. Yeah. Okay, so. Last but certainly not least on the list that we had the opportunity to get into, the Rivian R1T pickup. Henry. Well, a lot, a lot of anticipation for this uh, vehicle. Um, when do we see it? The 2018 LA Auto Show. So long time coming. Uh, this is a startup uh, automaker. And... Um, and uh, th this this vehicle back in 2018 was synonymous uh, with Tesla because the Model 3 was coming to market at that time. Uh, what's, what's very interesting, and we'll see if this proves out in the reliability reports, but I think um, Rivian was very aware of Tesla's manufacturing problems um, as, as, it, as it dialed up its uh, vehicle. And uh, it'll be interesting to see um, if, if, if this has any of the teething problems that the Model 3 had. The Model 3, uh, you know, when, when Musk dropped that bomb, uh, instantly got 250,000 orders, including mine. I mean, people were so blown away with a the car, they wanted it. And, and obviously, Tesla had a really hard time getting their, their arms around that kind of volume of manufacturing. Rivian is coming into the market with a first edition vehicle only coming in with small volumes, and I think they want to make sure they get the manufacturing right. Uh, that said, this is a Tesla pickup, uh, a good year before you're going to see a Cybertruck. The, the operating philosophy in the interior, uh, the, way they, the, way they, um, the way the screens work, the way the very minimalist uh, uh, controls work on the steering wheel are very Tesla-like. And as a Tesla driver myself, uh, I, I, uh, I, I became... Um, comfortable in the car immediately. Uh, you operate the um, uh, the uh, uh, autonomous drive feature with a double pull on the stalk, just like a Tesla. Uh, so I, I think this is, uh, for, for folks who, who, um, who, who are more uh, adventure oriented and are looking for a Tesla pickup truck, you may get a lot of people are going to buy this and, and not wait for the Cybertruck. Yeah, I'm with you on that, Henry. Uh, right off the bat, it looks different. You know, it's got those weird kind of headlamps, but that makes it stand out from everything else in the crowd. Look for the first vehicle ever from a brand new company. This is very well done. Uh, clearly, like you said, uh, Tesla was the target. So many of the graphics and so many of the controls are copied right out of what Tesla's already done. And I like what you said, that this is actually, a you know, kind of a Tesla truck. I, I'm super impressed by uh, what they've done, uh, you know, especially considering it's their first time effort. Uh, they're beating everybody to the market, not just Tesla, GM, Ford and Ram as well. Uh, so we'll see if they can take that first mover advantage and really run with it. But if they can, uh, they could be a real player in the pickup segment or at least the electric part of the pickup segment. All right, so I'm going to disagree with both of you. <laughs> I, 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 you know, while, while there will be, there are similarities to Tesla. I think if we were to look into various ICE vehicles from one to the other to the other, we say, oh, that's a similar thing, but we wouldn't think about it, right? I mean, because that's just what we're we're familiar just seeing the same thing over and over again. We get into an electric vehicle, we say, okay, we've got to compare it to what Tesla's doing, and it's always become the uh, the benchmark. I think these guys basically said, you know what? We're going to engineer the best friggin' pickup truck we can, period. And we're going to pay attention to every single little detail on this thing. I mean, I was I was set not to like it. And I was just completely amazed about what these guys had done. I mean, I mean, even to the point of, you know, the way you open the door for charging. 
you know, there's this little part, there, there's this texture and you touch it on the outside and the door comes up and opens. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's articulated. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful. And I mean, the fit and finish and materials on the inside of that thing. I mean, you'd think that they've been making cars for a long time. I mean, and, and that they finally achieved it, but these guys right out of the box doing that. I mean, it's just, just extraordinary. And oh, and oh, by the way, you know, it looks and acts like a pickup truck. I mean, unlike the Cybertruck, which doesn't look or act like a pickup truck, right? Well, so and, I, and, to, and, and, and another detail, I think, uh, Gary, which is really telling, I agree with you. They've, they've, they've really sweated the details on this. Uh, this. This is essentially a midsize pickup truck. This is not a huge uh, F-150 uh, competitor. This is essentially the size of a Honda Ridgeline which is also a unibody uh, based truck like this. But these guys, the Honda Ridgeline tows 5,000 pounds. These, these guys have taken the, uh, the, um, the battery box that's underneath the unibody chassis, and they have bulked that thing up to act like a ladder frame. This, this vehicle will tow 11,000 pounds. So that's what pickup people want to your point. And, and they're, so they're, 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 it, 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 it's a clean sheet, different approach to a pickup, but they're not forgetting why people buy pickups. Mm -hmm. All right, so, that, so that's the end of the list. Now, um, just to be fair, I, I, I should I should point out that in the in the car category, the Lucid Air is is on the list that we didn't get to drive, and the Mercedes EQS um, in the crossover category we did not have the opportunity to drive. But that said. We went through all of them, and uh, gee, Henry, you gave away one of your votes, or you announced what it would be. <laughs> I like that Maverick. Yeah, apparently you do. <laughs> all right, you you you're, you're supposed to leave at five or four fifteen, and it's four sixteen, so you're late, but you drive very quickly. Yeah, well, I, I enjoy being with you guys. Thanks for having me on. Always great to be on with with uh, you, Gary and John. Thanks, Thanks. Henry. Thanks, Henry, and yeah. we'll see you next week, Gary. Okay. Bye-bye. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Magna. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.